And welcome back to the program on this Saturday morning. I'm your host, Randall White, and we are coming to you live from downtown San Luis Obispo, California. And as I mentioned in the last segment, our compass word this hour is bubble. It's a, simply a word we use each week to connect all of our second hour guests with a theme. Now, using the term bubble for this week's show, we're able to explore the worlds of food, beverages, and travel with a little bit of a twist. Bubbles are everywhere, including in our food. Just look at a slice of bread. I mean, like, really look at it, and you'll find hundreds of pockets created by none other than gas bubbles during the breaking, uh, baking process. <laughs> Hopefully it's not breaking. That would be some hard bread. St- uh, Steve Sullivan with Acme Bread Company up in... Uh-oh, we've lost Steve. We have to get him back on the line. Steve Sullivan will be joining us in a moment with Acme Bread Company in Berkeley, California. And I'll tell you what, uh, back in the early 90s, uh, 91 through 95, I was a manager at the Marin Brewing Company. That's in Larkspur, California. And uh, you know how when you eat at a restaurant, you get some bread. And uh, our bread came from Acme Bakery, and it would come in fresh. Every single morning, they would deliver these huge bags of Acme bread, and they were still warm. And one thing that I have not been able to find here on the Central Coast is warm sourdough bread that comes packaged in paper, not plastic, and it has a hard outer crust and warm, soft insides. And I got to tell you, it is the only way to eat sourdough bread. You can get it. There, there's a bakery up in Atascadero called the uh, Safe Harbor Bakery, and you can buy it from them directly that way. But in the stores here, you are it's tough to find that uh, packaging with the in the paper, the way that I believe sourdoughs uh, should be packaged. All right, Steve Sullivan is back on the line from Acme Bread Company in Berkeley. And a very good morning to you, Steve. Good morning, Randall. Yeah, fan. it's really nice to speak with you, considering I've been eating your product for decades. <laughs> well, we, we don't like to call it product. We, we refer to it as bread. Yes, exactly, your bread for <laughs> decades. And uh, when did Acme get started? Uh, the, the, the company itself, uh, we started in... September of 1983, I, I had been baking bread in a restaurant in Berkeley for about four years before that. Oh, okay. And I've, I've always been curious because, you know, people associate Acme with, you know, the Roadrunner and the Coyote. Uh, how did you come up with the name? It was kind of a process of elimination. We, we eliminated every other word, and that's what we were left with. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, we, wanted it to, we wanted it to not be sort of a, a cute name, which we're very popular at the time in the early 80s, and mm-hmm. we didn't want it to be a French name, and we didn't want it to have uh, our name, uh, you know, we didn't want it to be a personal name. We wanted it to indicate that it was a place where people were working hard, that it wasn't a little sort of boutique or dilettante right. operation. Uh-huh. And uh, the, the name, the word Acme means the pinnacle in Greek, and it also has a, a long history in America as a name for small industrial uh, uh, enterprises, yeah. particularly uh, around the turn of the century, the early part of the 20th century, which is why it appears in Roadrunner cartoons. Yeah, and also to let the bread speak for itself, right? It's not bi- people aren't buying it for the name; they're buying it because they right. love that, that bread. That was that was kind of our idea: is just to to have it be sort of a, a, a sort of a, a not flashy name that yeah. that sort of meant something, but that didn't really uh, you know try and make people laugh or gasp or. Like <laughs> I like that, Steve. All right, now, first off, the, I, and clearly this is in your opinion, what makes great bread or what many of us would consider to be great bread? Well, I think probably, I mean, you know, that there, there are a lot of factors, and certainly a lot of it has to do with the situation that a person, you know, is in yeah. when eating bread, when enjoying bread, when being served bread. But but to try and be a little bit objective about it, I would say that fermentation and adequate fermentation, for me, are the keys to uh, uh, getting, you know, uh, to getting texture and flavor that are both interesting and, uh, you know, and, and pleasant. And people forget that bread is a fermented product like wine or beer or yogurt. Uh, bread is fermented, and it's that process that creates our, key, our compass word for the day, bubbles, correct? Uh, well, that's true, yeah. The, uh, the, 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 the yeasts uh, produce carbon dioxide as a, as, a, as a byproduct of their activity, 
and those that carbon dioxide is trapped in the gluten network of the dough, uh, and those bubbles expand and uh, leaven the dough, uh, you know, turning it into something, uh, you know, to, to, to varying degrees less dense than a pudding. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. How important is it to have just the right yeast? Is that something that is kept under lock and key by many bakeries? Uh, well, there are certainly bakeries that keep it under lock and key. Uh, you know, uh, uh, our, our door never actually gets locked because we're op- always in operation. But, right. uh, but, but you know, if, if a person, if, if a certain bakery keeps the, the yeast under lock and key, then, then a person, another person who might want to use similar yeast would, would have to do something as complicated as, going to the store and getting some whole grain flour to acquire, you know, pretty much the same yeast. I see. Uh, because wild yeasts are prevalent in the environment, and commercial yeasts are prevalent in the stores. I see. So there's, there's no real way to maintain, there's no, there's no, you know, there's, there's no uh, exclusivity uh, in certain yeasts. I mean, <laughs> certain areas have certain yeasts that tend to predominate. Uh, wild yeasts appear on the exterior of lots and lots of different fruits. That's why, that's why grapes turn into wine, because uh-huh. wild yeast accumulates on the surface and, and ferments, the, ferments the sugars when, uh, when the grape right. skins break. Years ago, Steve, when I was a, a nutrition major at Cal Poly, I had taken a course on fermented products, and uh, right around that time, uh, San Luis sourdough was getting started, uh-huh. and there was a rumor going around. I don't remember learning this in my in any of my classes, but there was a rumor going around that the uh, founders of San Luis sourdough had paid uh, some substantial money for a sourdough starter from one of the companies in San Francisco, so they could really duplicate. <laughs> uh, is, does that sound like something that would be valid? Uh, well, certainly, if you own something that you perceive to be valuable and you want to try and exploit <laughs> it, and say, I mean, I, yeah. I've heard of companies doing that, trying to make money off of off of what they perceive their intellectual property to be. Uh-huh. Uh, but interestingly enough, I, you know, in a similar vein, there was an artisan baker uh, 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 several years ago who was dabbling in the uh, in the bread making licensing business which is similar to what you're suggesting right and he was charging a, a big a big sum to come out and help you set up your bakery and then a certain percentage of your sales oh. and one of the big deals in this process was the unveiling of the starter the transfer of the starter etc cetera, etc cetera. and a, a woman called me one time and told me the story of having uh, not realized how much money was going to be involved and thought that as a kindred spirit this was somebody who might help her for a you know, for a modest fee. And when she found out how much money was involved, she was aghast. And so she uh, ordered some of this fellow's uh, bread mail order, and she broke it up in bits and put it into a uh, flour and water slurry. And within a few hours, it was bubbling away with what was presumably the, the fabled starter from this bakery, which maybe had not been quite killed in the, uh, oh. in, the, in, the in the baking process. <laughs> right. So she, she felt very, uh, very uh, relieved not to have been led down the path of, of paying for something that, that you know, really yes. wasn't necessary to pay for. Steve, I want to mention, because we only have about 45 seconds left for this, that you've been using organic grains for a long time now, maybe before it was uh, fashionable uh, throughout the rest of the country. Well, we st- since we began, we always all our whole grains have always been organic. But in 1999, we were able to switch to using organic white flour as well, and it's just part of part of the part of the notion that we want to support the kind of farming that pays attention to the land and the condition of the of of the land, just as we like to do the kind of baking whereby the bakers are paying attention to the dough and the condition of the dough. Right. So Steve Sullivan with Acme Bread Company up in Berkeley. If you find yourself in San Francisco, there's no greater mecca for uh, foodies than the Ferry Plaza. And you have a location there, Steve, that I've been to. Grab a loaf and you will not be disappointed. Steve Sullivan again with Acme Bread Company. It's acmebread.com. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Just ahead, we're going to a national park where bubbles are one of the main themes there. I'm your host, Randall White, and we're back in just a moment.